Uh, I want to talk to Stephen Kennock now, who is the Shadow Immigration Minister. He is also the MP for Aberavon. Uh, Mr Kennock, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Talk TV this morning. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good morning. Thanks for inviting me on. Many of your constituents are having a major problem because Port Talbot, uh, the steelworks, is, uh, is there, there are going to be major, major changes there and a huge loss of jobs as well. We're talking about possibly 3,000 people losing their jobs. The reason they're losing, they may lose their jobs, and I know this is uh, open to consultation at the moment, is that there is a move to more green energy. I'm sure you would want to safeguard the, uh, work, the, the jobs of your constituents, but at the same time, surely Labour wants to move to more, to more green energy, and indeed you've talked about your £28 billion policy on that. Isn't there a contradiction in your position? Nobody at the Potolbert Steelworks is burying their head in the sand. They know that we have to decarbonise the steel industry. The question is, how do you do that? And I'm afraid that the deal that Tata has done with the UK government is a bad deal. The UK government is giving £500 million of taxpayers' money to Tata in order to make 2,800 people redundant. That's just absolutely crazy. The deal that should be being done is the compelling proposal that the multi-unions have put down which is about uh, keeping one of the blast furnaces going for a period of time whilst the smaller electric arc furnace is being built. That enables you to continue to produce steel from scratch whilst combining that with the electric arc furnace and you get a bridge then to a much more phased transition, ultimately just having electric arc furnace and something called direct reduced iron. But you've got to get there in a phased way rather than this brutal cliff edge, which would mean both blast furnaces being shut down uh, before the end of this year and 2,800 people being made redundant. So the big question for the UK government is why have they done a deal with Tata Steel, which apparently has no strings attached and no consideration to jobs and to that phased transition that we need? But isn't there a contradiction in your position? You didn't answer that question, Mr Kinnock, with respect. Well, no, because uh, one of the other key points here is the, the commercial imperative. The vast majority of Tata Steel's customers and the Potolba customers in the automotive sector, in the housing sector, in the white goods sector, they want less carbon in their product. Uh, so, you know, it's not just about net zero. It's also about the market is moving. Now, the crazy thing about the Tata Steel deal with the UK government is also that whilst they're waiting for this big uh, this huge electric arc furnace to be built, which could take three or four years, they're going to be, be importing millions of tonnes of steel from India. In India, steel making is 30 to 40 percent more carbon intensive uh, than steel making in the UK. And that's before you take into account the carbon footprint of shipping the steel from okay. the other side of the world. So it's a, it's a crazy plan. Our plan is much more about uh, keeping uh, the jobs in the UK and having that pathway to decarbonisation. Stephen, you are also the Shadow Immigration Minister. I think a lot of our viewers and listeners are not really clear what Labour would do. And I actually just want to play a little clip from Rishi Sunak at his press conference on Thursday this week. I ex I'll expect you will have seen this, but I just want to remind people what he said and then ask you to respond to it. Let's just play the clip of Rishi Sunak. All right, so the question and the focus now has got to be on our plan which is already delivering, we are already making progress with the numbers down last year by over a third, or what the Labour Party is saying, where there is absolutely no plan, would take us back to square one. And that's worse because I don't actually believe Keir Starmer wants to resolve this issue. As I said, when he was asked if he would stick with the Rwanda scheme, even when it was up and running and working, he said he would still scrap it. Right? I think that tells you what you need to know. Right? This is someone who says, oh, he's interested in smashing the gangs. But then the question I still haven't had an answer to is why then does the Labour Party vote against the powers in our previous act which have allowed us to arrest 873 criminals and people smugglers who have now been sentenced to over 350 years in jail? Right. Those are new powers that we passed to smash the gangs that are leading to people being taken off the streets and put in jail, which all contributes to a deterrent effect. But the Labour Party voted against that. So Keir Starmer will say one thing and do another thing, right? And that, um, that is symptomatic of his overall approach to leadership, right? This is an election year, and the choice of that election is going to be clear, right? We have got a plan. That plan is working. If we stick with it, we can deliver a brighter future for the country, renewed pride 
in our country. And the alternative is that we go back to square one. Stephen Kinnock, Rishi Sunak talking about going back to square one. You, as a Labour MP, voted against the Rwanda plan this week. You also voted against the Nationality and Borders Act and the Illegal Migration Act. The one thing that people know about Labour's immigration plan is that they want to smash the gangs, but there's legislation in place already that has allowed 873 people, as Rishi Sunak was saying, to go to prison. Why, why are the gangs not being smashed at the moment? What more needs to be done and what would Labour do? Well, it's frankly laughable to hear the Prime Minister saying that their Rwanda plan is working when they've sent £400 million to Rwanda. Let's talk about gangs. We'll talk about Rwanda in a minute, but I want to ask you about gangs, if that's OK, first. Yeah, not a single asylum seeker has gone. The only people who have gone there is three Home Secretaries. On the point of the gangs, uh, the crucial issue here is about international cooperation, because clearly we've got to go after the gangs upstream. It, the, the cooperation with France is good in terms of the downstream, you know, um, slashing the dinghies when they're on the beaches in northern France is good, but what you've got to do is go after them upstream. That means much better data sharing, means much better cooperation. So our plan, and, and Keir Starmer and Yvette Cooper went to Europol in The Hague to discuss this and to agree this, that we would be seconding officers from our National Crime Agency and from the uh, cross-border elite, cross-border cross police force into Europol, into Frontex, so we can have much better cooperation to go after the gangs okay. upstream and to change the data sharing arrangements so that we've got much better cooperation. But of course, it's difficult to do that for the Conservatives because they've spent the last few years destroying our relationships with our European well, partners. They've, 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 also, paying the price for that. they've also put legislation forward that's put 873 people involved in criminal gangs in prison. Do you regret voting against that legislation? We voted against the Nationality and Borders Act because it was never going to work. It had all sorts of clauses in it that were just going to make the whole it's process It's working work. in that respect. Would you, ex would illegal... you accept that it's working in that respect? I don't. I, I have to be clear with you. I don't know which particular clauses he's referring to because we've always supported strong police cooperation. We would never oppose anything which is helping to smash the gangs who are trading millions of I mean, you've voted against legislation which misery. brought in legislation that has put those 873 people in prison, or is Rishi Sunak incorrect in that? We vote for legislation that is going to work. Nothing that the Tories bring that forward... That legislation has put work. 873 just, people in makes. prison, Mr Kinnock. Well, we've been absolutely clear that we will smash the gangs when we come into power. Part of it is about, of course, uh, having the right laws in place, but it's also about having the right political and diplomatic relations in place. And unfortunately, as I say, we've got a government which has been committed to destroying, burning every bridge that we have with our European partners and allies. And we are paying the price for that now in terms of our own national security and in terms of the fact that the Conservatives have completely lost control of our borders and completely lost control of our asylum system. What do your constituents in Aberavon tell you about the level of immigration in this country? What are their views? I think there's no doubt at all that uh, immigration is too high. I mean, it was an extraordinary 745,000 net what, what, migration. What, should, what so, should it be, do you think? What, 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 what's the right level? Putting a number on it is something we're not going to do because we've seen how Why successive not? conservative prime ministers have pulled these arbitrary numbers out of the air and never delivered on them. And all that's done is destroy trust in politics. It's destroyed trust in uh, people's view that we have we can control our borders so and of course you know you get things like the ukraine war or the hong kong crisis things come at you because of the geopolitical turbulence in the world so it's ridiculous to be a hostage to fortune and put a specific number but what we are clear is that immigration must come down net migration is too high in this country it's because the conservatives have failed to invest in a proper skills and apprenticeship system we've got 2.5 million people on long-term sick leave not going into work so we've got to fix the system so that local homegrown talent is given opportunities to work rather than having businesses constantly reaching for the lever of bringing uh, workers in from other countries. And I'm afraid the um, huge numbers that we're seeing in terms of uh, work-based migration, uh, the huge increases are because of broader failures of the last 14 years to create a labour market that actually works for our local homegrown talent. It's not just about labour market, though, as well. There have been 
many problems. Uh, look, uh, immigration can be a very good thing. I think there are a lot of immigrants who make a real contribution to this country, of course. But we also have some negatives. We've been talking about grooming gangs this week. We've been talking about an increased risk of radicalization and a terror threat. We have disgraceful pro-Hamas and anti-Semitic demonstrations taking place in our capital every weekend. Not everybody who is taking part in that, of course, is an immigrant. But there are negative points to the immigration to this country as well as positive points, are there not? Well, I mean, we've also got real challenges in terms of our social infrastructure because the Tories have spent the last 14 years destroying our public services and failing to build enough houses. Can, can you just maybe pressure. engage with the point a little bit about radicalisation and terror? Well, I, well I, was, I was adding to your points around okay. some of the challenges that we face. And, you know, oh, clearly we, we need to have uh, far more effective programmes like Prevent, which are going into uh, communities and ensuring that we identify risks of radicalization. We need much better community cohesion and uh, education in our schools. But I would also say that our diversity as a country, I think, is a major source of strength. And uh, so many, as you say, uh, uh, people from uh, different backgrounds come to our country and they offer a huge amount in terms of our cultural diversity, the strength of our society, and they bring a lot to our economy as well. Lots of uh, immigrants are very young, fit, healthy people who are working hard, paying their taxes and contributing. So it's about control and fairness. And if you lose control of the system, you can start to lose uh, public trust in a system. Just, just on that point on, on, on public trust in a system, I'm not going to hold you personally responsible for the record of the last Labour government. It was, let's remember, 14 years ago. But we've looked and seen archive papers, for example. Uh, Tony Blair wanted to send illegal migrants to the Isle of Mull, uh, possible asylum centres in uh, Turkey and South Africa. Were those ideas wrong? Well, uh, clearly they were looked at and they were dismissed. I suppose the difference between us and the... Tories is the Rwanda, the, the Tories looked at Rwanda and decided it was a good idea where it clearly wasn't and was never going to work. We assess things when, when Labour is in government, we look at solving problems and when he's wanting to solve problems, you look at all the options, but some options are unworkable, unaffordable and unlawful. And if they don't pass all three of those tests, a Labour government will never implement them. I want to ask you about a story we're talking about today. It was in the Daily Telegraph yesterday about channel migrants being, being given the right to work in the UK. These are people who their asylum ha decision has not been made yet. They've been waiting over a year. They're allowed to apply for jobs where they get 80% of what the going rate is. I have concerns and a number of our viewers and listeners have concerns about the background of those people. First of all, we don't know whether they're legitimate asylum seekers or not, although to be clear, about 70 to 75% of people who apply for asylum in this country get it. But nonetheless, we don't know the background of those people. And they're working with people in the caring system. They're working with vulnerable elderly people and children. Is that right? Well, the fundamental problem here is that nobody should be waiting for more than six months for a decision on their asylum claim. So what if you had a processing system that actually worked rather than the completely dysfunctional and shambolic one we have now, everyone, everyone would be processed well under the 12-month threshold so that's point number one you, you and then you have once you've got a decision on somebody's asylum claim and they are then considered to be a genuine refugee they're given leave to remain i think is absolutely right then that they have the right to work we don't want people who are genuine refugees then hanging around in the system not able to work and they can then work make a tr contribution to our economy pay taxes and move forward and i'm sure uh, contribute a lot to our society what you can't have though is a system that's so dysfunctional that people are often in, in there for well over 12 months 18 24 48 months even but once they've been in the system for more than 12 months they are able to work that is the government's position i think both theresa may and boris johnson looked at that and decided that it needed to continue because um it, you once you've got people hanging around in the system for that period of time it becomes such a drain on the public purse uh, that you've got to have a way of dealing with that issue. But the fundamental cause of the problem is the total and utter shambles in our uh, backlog. We've still got a backlog of 100,000. We've got many, many people waiting for more, much more than 12 months. There should be a six-month service standard. The Tories quietly dropped the six-month service standard. Uh, I think in about 2018 or 2019, and as a, once that happened, you started to see the backlog going through the roof. Let's get everybody processed in under six months. Are you a genuine refugee or not? If you are not, you must be removed from the country. 
And if you are, then you're given leave to remain and the right to work and to contribute to our society and play a positive role. You are very likely to be the next immigration minister, unless there's a reshuffle between, between now and the next election. Labour are 27 points ahead, according to a YouGov poll out this week. What is the first thing you're going to do on, on day one as immigration minister if you get that role under a Labour government? Stop the Tory vote chaos by smashing the gangs and getting much better deals with uh, our European partners and allies and having a proper removals policy in place because removals have gone down by so much since 2010. Clear the asylum backlog uh, by uh, getting people out of hotels, getting the processing system work. And again, the removals is a hugely important part of that. And then get a balanced and sustainable work-based migration, which is a points-based system, yes, yeah. Uh, but a points-based system that is properly connected to the real economy so that businesses have got to have workforce plans, skills plans, uh, which show that they are maximising opportunities for local talent, uh, as well as, of course, they're going to, they're, we're always going to need some work-based migration, but the balance is completely out of kilter now. So those are the top three priorities. Stop the Tory boats, chaos, clear the asylum backlog, get people out of hotels, and have a balanced and sustainable work-based migration policy. I'm going to be totally honest with you, Mr Kenning. There's a lot of Talk TV viewers and listeners who don't trust Labour. Why should they trust you? Why should they trust Labour, especially on this very important issue of immigration? They should trust Labour because we are a united party that is not completely absorbed into the civil wars and factionalism that we're seeing in the Conservative Party. If you so can't tr govern trust your own us party, we're, Trust us because we're not the Tories? We're, because we're united, which you, you, if you can't govern your own party, you certainly can't govern the country. And then I think it's also about not being a party of headline chasing gimmicks and trying to throw red meat to this audience or that audience. We will put country before party. We will roll up our sleeves and it will be about hard graft and common sense and pragmatic, competent approach to government and also about our, our, our Labour values, which are about bringing the country together rather than constantly trying to set one group against another. And it's prioritising dealing with the cost of living crisis, fixing our crumbling public services, getting on with the basic work of government rather than having your whole time absorbed with trying to deal with one faction fighting against another. That would be my pitch to the country. A lot of what you talk about, Stephen Kinnock, certainly in regard to immigration, is going to cost money. Another thing that uh, Labour has been talking about is £28 billion green policy, for example. That is something where we're not really sure where the land lies on that and the message frankly, has changed a couple of times. I want to give you this opportunity just to clarify Labour's position on tax and whether it would raise taxes or lower them. We're committed to lowering taxes on working people. We have said we will increase taxes on non-DOMs. You're going to close, we're going to close the non-DOMs. not going to pay for everything, though, is it? No, but you're asking me about... Uh, the specific position is on taxes, there will be higher taxes for those who are most able to deal with that, the wealthiest in our society who we think should contribute a bit more, the non-DOMs, private schools, and the, uh, the asset managers where there's loopholes around their bonuses. So there's some really important measures that we will be taking. But then in terms of balancing the books, that's about getting growth back into our economy. And the £28 billion uh, Green Prosperity Plan will play a really important part of that. It's something we'll ramp up so that we're getting to that level by the second half of the parliamentary, uh, for our first parliamentary term. But by the way, a really important part of that 28 billion is a three billion pound clean steel fund, which is there to support our steel makers uh, to get that bridge to a more cleaner, greener, decarbonised uh, future. So it's about having, uh, we're going to get Britain building again. Uh, we're going to get the NHS back onto its feet. We're going to get crime off our streets and we're going to break uh, the class ceiling. We're going to give your people the opportunities that they need, regardless of the background they've come from, where they live in the country. It's about breaking that class ceiling and getting our education system working again. It's a huge agenda. Uh, it, it can't just be about um, changing the way we do government. It also requires investment. It requires resources. But we will only ever borrow to invest 
as long as the debt as debt is falling over the economic cycle. So it's about sound fiscal management, stopping all the chaos and uncertainty and instability with goodness knows how many prime ministers and chancellors we've had over the last few years, giving business the certainty they need to be able to invest in the future and committing to our mission-driven government, which I think is what the, the country desperately needs because we are in many ways in a state of crisis and it's going to need some radical reforming change uh, after the next general election uh, to actually get Britain working again and get Britain back on its feet. Stephen Kenning, just a final question. We have a lot of Welsh listeners and they do have uh, many questions about the Labour's government in Wales. What is your assessment of the job they're doing? Because people have many questions about how they've run the country, about Mark Drake for standing down, about the, for example, 20 mile an hour speed limits, for example, a big issue recently. What's your assessment of them? Oh, well, I think that Labour in Wales has done an outstanding job. We've been in government since 1998, since devolution started. We're, of course, the architects of devolution, and uh, we've got we've done a huge amount of work in terms of the skills agenda, in terms of the economic agenda, in terms of trying to cushion the blow from austerity to the greatest extent possible uh, in Wales. And I think that. We've now got, of course, a leadership contest. Full disclosure, I'm a supporter of Vaughan Gething. I think Vaughan has got a really bold and ambitious uh, vision for the future uh, of Wales. And on the 20 mile an hour, of course, he said very clearly that there needs to be a review of that policy. It's been in place for long enough now to see where it's working and where it isn't. And, um, you know, local authorities in Wales and the public have to have a voice in that consultation very, process. Very, very, and Vaughan is committed to that. Very briefly in 30 seconds, Mr. Kenneth, because we've got to go to a break. What will Labour do to safeguard British values of tolerance and freedom? That's a question from Marion County Down. The values of tolerance and freedom are in our DNA. Uh, the Labour Party was set up uh, to uh, be the voice of working people in Parliament. Uh, it is a party that is about bringing uh, opportunity to all parts of our country. And it, we also recognise uh, that in order to have those values of tolerance and inclusivity, you have to take account of people's legitimate concerns uh, about the future of our country, about our identity as a country, building the strength in diversity, but always having that control and uh, very responsible approach to the way we manage immigration and to the way we manage our economy and the way we manage our public services. That's the best way of spreading opportunity across our country, spreading prosperity across our country, and from that, the values of inclusion and tolerance flow.